Welcome to the first part of Lecture 18, The Introduction to Complex Numbers. It's entitled Z equals X plus IY and some functions of Z. So we're going to start now our unit on discussing complex numbers. You have to recall that complex numbers are closely related to numbers in two dimensions. We write Z as X plus IY with I squared equals minus 1. And so i is the square root of minus 1, i squared is equal to minus 1, i cubed is equal to minus i, and finally i to the fourth is equal to 1. So if you like, i is a fourth root of unity. Sometimes we prefer to use a polar representation, and that's illustrated for you on the left-hand side in the figure. r is just the same as it is in regular polar coordinates, the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta is once again the same, it's the arctangent of y over x. Then if we're using those polar coordinates and we're expressing the complex number in terms of r and theta, if we want the real part, that would be x, that would just be r cosine theta, and the imaginary part, which would be y, would be r sine theta. Now, this is all stuff that you're familiar with just from polar coordinates, but with complex numbers we often like to use complex notation, and so we introduce something called the complex conjugate, which is denoted by z bar, or sometimes it's denoted z star, and z bar is exactly the same as z, except we change the sign of the imaginary part. So z bar would equal x minus iy if z is equal to x plus iy. Then in terms of z and z bar, we can express things rather simply. r is just the square root of z, z bar. Or another way of writing this, we write the modulus squared of the complex number z would equal z times z bar. And if I explicitly write that out, I will get x plus iy for z, and I'll get x minus iy for z bar. And if I multiply those out, that's going to be x squared minus the quantity iy squared which ends up being x squared plus y squared, which is what the square of the radius is, or the square of the modulus of the complex number. That's the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. Okay, another useful technique that you need to be familiar with is called rationalizing the denominator. And for that, if I have a complex number in the denominator of a, of a fraction, I can multiply by 1 by multiplying by the complex conjugate in the numerator and in the denominator. Then the denominator becomes r squared, or the modulus squared, or x squared plus y squared. And the numerator just still remains the complex conjugate. So 1 over z will equal z bar divided by z times z bar. Or if we want to write it in the alternative notation, it will be z bar over the modulus of z squared. This is a pretty important identity and a pretty important manipulation for you to remember. You can use this to simplify lots of different kinds of equations and I strongly encourage you to become familiar and adept with using uh, the notion of rationalizing the denominator. Now another thing we're going to work on is De Moivre's theorem which helps us find the nth roots of unity and uh, part of De Moivre's theorem starts by looking at the expression e to the i theta, which it claims is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, when we look at this, there actually are two ways that we can prove this. The simple way is if we look at our polar coordinates, where r is equal to 1, that number is what we call e to the i theta. e to the i theta is a number that lies on the unit circle and it's at an angle theta. How do I know it's on the unit circle? The modulus z squared of e to the i theta would be e to the i theta times e to the minus i theta, and that of course has a modulus of 1. So r is equal to 1, and I'm at some angle theta, and then I just look at the projection. The projection onto the x-axis, which is the real part, will be r cosine theta, but r is equal to 1, so that's just cosine theta. The projection onto the y-axis will be i sine theta, sorry, will be 1 times sine theta, or r sine theta, but r is equal to 1, and so that's just equal to sine theta, so I get cosine theta plus i sine theta. It's as simple as that. Uh, it's a little bit more interesting to take a look at it algebraically, and so we're going to carefully go through that next. So we're going to start with this, the reminder of what De Moivre's theorem is, and then we're going to just recall that 
the different there are a number of different ways of determining the real part of a complex number we can the simplest is to write it as z plus its complex conjugate divided by 2 and then the imaginary part of a complex number is z minus its complex conjugate divided by 2i and then if we recall our Taylor series expansion for the exponential e to the i theta would just equal 1 plus i theta plus 1 half quantity i theta squared plus 1 6 quantity i theta cubed plus 1 over 24 quantity i theta to the fourth plus 1 over 120 quantity i theta to the fifth and so on the coefficient is 1 over n factorial and then I raise i theta to the nth power we can similarly express e to the minus i theta what happens is every odd power term gets a minus sign and now if z is equal to e to the i theta I can get the real part of z by looking at z plus z bar which would be e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta divided by 2 and so we just go ahead and do that all the odd terms are going to cancel I'll just be left with the even terms and because of the 1 over 2 it just equals the even term so I get 1 plus a half quantity i theta squared plus 1 over 24 quantity i theta to the fourth and so on and then I can pull out the factors of i and I get 1 minus a half theta squared plus 1 over 24 theta to the fourth and so on and we immediately recognize that is the Taylor series expansion for cosine theta or if you like because we already do derive that the real part of e to the i theta is cosine theta this is an alternative derivation of the power series expansion for cosine of theta it also gives us this identity that cosine theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 which is an identity that you've probably heard of but here we can see explicitly how the proof for that comes about similarly we can work with the imaginary part and now all of the odd powers are going to survive I'm going to take out that factor of i and do that division and we'll get theta minus 1 6 theta cubed plus 1 over 120 theta to the fifth and so forth and you'll immediately recognize that's the Taylor series expansion for sine theta or equivalently you can view it as a derivation of the Taylor series expansion for sine theta hence we learn these two identities cosine theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2 and sine theta is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2 i really really useful identities I encourage you to remember these identities they will come up again and again and the more that you can recognize and use these identities the easier you'll find it will be to do different kinds of algebra all right let's complete De Moy's theorem we're going to assume that z is equal to e to the i theta then z to the n is e to the i n theta which is cosine n theta plus i sine n theta and if I want z to the n to equal 1 then I need n theta to equal a multiple of 2 pi and so I'm going to write it as 2 i pi little n with 0 less than or equal to little n less than or equal to big n and then if I take the nth root of that I take 1 to the n over big n I get e to the 2 i pi little n over big n now let's take a look at what that looks like these are actually the roots of unity and you can see they're going to actually be evenly distributed about the unit circle in the example that I've given you there we have one two three four five six seven eight nine uh, there are nine terms there so that would be the nine roots or the ninth roots of unity and there are nine of them they're equally spaced around the unit circle and they all of course have modulus of one all right we're going to move on now to uh, discussing the logarithm because the logarithm has some surprises if you recall z is equal to r e to the i theta when I express it in polar coordinates then if I take the logarithm of that I'm going to just get log r plus i theta so I find this very interesting the real part is what I would kind of think of as the logarithm of the number it's the logarithm of the radius but then I have this complex piece which is i times theta and every time I see this for a complex numbers I always take a step back and say oh yeah I kind of understand it because if z is equal to r e to the i theta I take the logarithm indeed this is exactly what I'm going to get but I always find it looks kind of weird to me we can also write this in terms of the z and its complex conjugate as one half log z z bar plus i theta now what is the weird thing about this well 
the theta is going to run between 0 and 2 pi in the complex plane, but you can see as theta goes around from 0 to 2 pi, the logarithm doesn't come back to itself. It started at log r when theta is equal to 0, but it ends at log r plus i2 pi. So it's discontinuous as I wind around the circle. And indeed, the one of the ways in which this gets fixed in complex variables theory is that you instead allow it to continue to wind around and it acts kind of like a spiral. So every time I wind around the origin, I will get an extra factor of 2 pi i. And so this will spiral up and it will also sp spiral down if I wind around in the opposite direction. And so the logarithm has some strange properties to it. And because it has those strange, prop strange properties, I wanted to bring those to your attention here.